an eight in this class, not because you know anything, but just because I keep screwing up up here. I'm kidding, you know lots. Um, okay, so let's do this. We're gonna talk, that's yellow. What's wrong with yellow? Nothing's wrong with yellow, but it's not the easiest thing to read from a distance, is it? Um, what do you have against the moon? Lesson 2.4. Mitosis. Okay. <laughs> Ethan, that, that may have been a little creepy. Anyway, we'll get to this. So mitosis is the name given to how complex cells and when I say complex cells, that means like cells with organelles. Um, reproduce. Yeah. How long? The end of this unit. Mm, a few weeks away, maybe two and a half weeks away. Um, and I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping to get a couple. Interesting kind of dissection pieces in. Oh, I wanted to ask you guys. Do we have time? I don't have time now. Hopefully, I'll have time for this at the end of the close. I want to pick your brains because uh, my co op students are planning grade eight and I want to get ideas from you. Anyway, um, so yeah. Can I be a part okay, yeah, I, I'm looking for volunteers. So in basic, it's still just binary fission. I.e., what we're basically going to get is one cell with its DNA, the difference be, oh, that's not how I want to draw that at all, I'm sorry. You don't have to worry about color coding, but I am. With its DNA here, and what we're gonna do is end up with two cells. And what do we call the two cells? Compared to the parent, we call them the gendered language. Daughter cells, yeah. Why not just child cells, offspring cells? I don't know. We call that the parent cell, and we call these the daughter cells. This is true. The basic, the basic animal body plan is female. And in humans, um, it, every, every male reproductive organ, but also all the secondary sex characteristics and all that, is just a variation on the female body plan. We just... You know, like in a video game when you're designing your character, you just like, you know, stretch the sliders and it changes like brown shit, big head, small head. That's it. That's all it is. And uh, it's actually, if you take grade 11 biology, you'll learn all about how sexual dimorphism, in other words, how like the fact that there's a male and female of some species, not of all species, by the way, um, works. But it's, it's actually pretty interesting because it's at one time simpler than you might think and on another level way more complex than you might think. Anyway, not what we're talking about now. Um, but... The presence of organelles makes it a little bit more complicated, just a little bit. Nope. Just this, and then uh, then we're actually gonna have a bit of time to. I, I'm I don't know. God, I'm talking too much. Just stop asking questions. I'm already running late. Um, I was hoping to give you some work time for something different, but I don't know if we'll get to it now because I talk too much. Um, maybe, maybe you've noticed. Okay, so here's the basic thing. Cells have what's called, the well, it's not called this. Nor, cells have the normal cell life. This is before reproducing. Depending on the age of your parents, they might talk about what their normal lives were like before they reproduced. Um, like in my I case, <laughs> in my case, like my adult life started basically with having kids. I was still in university when I had kids. So I don't really, I never experienced this. But no, no, I wouldn't change a thing. But I'll say this, I wouldn't recommend it. It was very hard work. It was exhausting. It was financially very straining. Um, it definitely set you back. Like, would I change a thing? No. Uh, like I love my kids and I love the experiences we had. And like, kind of struggling through those years was special and I treasure it. Having said that, like when I look at my friends who waited until they were 28 to have kids and they already owned a house and like they had jobs that paid well and they weren't trying to go to school. Like, you know, I took my kid to like university lectures and was like rocking him in his car seat like while trying to take notes and pay attention to like a protein and enzyme biochemistry lesson. 
it was hard work. You know, I was working two jobs and going to school. My wife was working a job and going to school and raising kids. And we had tons of help. I can't even imagine. Because we had my parents, my wife's parents. I can't imagine for the life of me how, like, a single parent does it. If you have single parents, you should go home and just, like, just, uh, you, should, uh, you should buy them something nice. You should be like, hey, here's flowers. And even if, they, even if you're like, my parents are crappy, I'm sure my kids would tell you that I'm crappy. But like, it's so hard. Even being, a, even being a terrible parent is hard work. I can't imagine how the people who do it well do it. Like, it, it is hard. So like, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, but if you want my advice, I would say get yourself set up a bit. Get yourself in a position where your life's a little bit easier. And then have kids, and then they'll make it impossible again. But having said that, if you do it, if you have kids young, Trust me when I say you won't regret it. Like it's, you know. I'd rather have kids. Though. But uh, yeah, and those advantages too. I like, uh, to like my dad, my dad and mom were married at seventeen. Not a thing people do so much anymore. And they had my sister at seventeen, me at nineteen. And like, here's the thing for them: they like hang out with, they hung out with their grandkids. But like when they were grandparents, they were thirty nine and forty, and so they were like young and youthful and could do cool stuff with their grandparents, right? Like my parents will likely probably live to hang out with their great grandkids. I knew three of my great-grandparents growing up. My kids grew up with two living great-great-grandparents. Uh, and they had both of those until one of them died six years ago. One of them just died last year, right? So pretty cool. I mean, she also lived to 108, which helps. But anyway, um, I have no intention of living to 108. I have, not as we know, an intention of living to 100,008 because I'm going to be a brain in a jar with robot spider legs. But more on that later. Um, so cells... Um, just living their cell lives. Wake up, go to the bank. Wake up, go to the cell bank, drive their cell car to the cell work and drop their cell kids off on the way at school. Um, just living their lives are said to be in interphase, which is really telling because, in other words, a cell that isn't busy reproducing, and we say, ah, it's just in between, in between reproduction. Um, so that literally just means inter means between, Right? So between reproduction cycles. It kind of does, doesn't it? Interphase. This cell's in interphase. This cell's in the speed force. Um, but there we go. Um, this can last a long time. All right? Your brain cells... Um, will be with you your whole life. Um, you make some new ones as you go, but only to repair certain types of damage that the body can repair. Um, but your brain cells can live, I don't know, 120 years. I don't think, has any person lived to 120? Probably not. Let's say 110. That's happened. Um, or a short time. Um, you know, some bacteria reproduce every hour. I would say for a bacterium that reproduces every hour, calling its time between reproduction interphase makes sense. I would say for a brain cell that's going to be hanging out for 110 years, saying it's in interphase seems a little silly, doesn't it? Um, but that's okay. Uh, that's the word we use. But at the end of interphase, um, the cell makes copies of all its DNA. And when we say copies, we mean duplicates, exact copies of all its DNA and grows bigger. That is just like bacteria. Does that make sense? So just like simple cells. And I'll give you a minute to write this. I know I'm going fast. Um, so I'll give you a moment to write that down. And I will put my cup of tea. That's what I'll do. Somebody, and I think it's one of the mutants in Mr. Elastchuk's 3U chemistry class, keeps using my teaspoon both to get the sugar and then to stir. 
And so the sugar spoon is like a big clumpy mess of sugar. And then all the sugar in the sugar bowl is sugar, sugar bowl. That was the creepiest thing I've ever said unintentionally. All the sugar in the sugar bowl is a big clumpy mess. Don't be that guy. I think I know who it is too. But anyway, the elegant way is you use the sugar spoon to lift it over and from a bit of a height, drop it in there so that the steam doesn't make it solidify. And if it does look like it's picked up some steam, you can even like set aside and wait until it's kind of like dissipated off and then put it back in the sugar bowl. That keeps the sugar from solidifying. And then you use a different teaspoon to mix it. That's all. Yeah, and then I have these adorable little ones. Two minutes, be quick. Go, go. Uh, this is a green peppermint tea. Would you like some? You're welcome. I would offer you all a cup of tea, except Ms. Uh, Ms. Bainbridge has my teapot right now, and I don't have time to make like 15 cups of tea. So I apologize. If you'd like a cup of tea, you can get milk one. Go nuts. Right in there? Go nuts. Um, but as a rule, um, I should do that more often in this class. I'm always happy to make a pot of tea and bring like the tray out and you guys can serve yourselves. If you remind, I will never remember, but if you remind me, I'm always happy to do that. All right. That's right, and you guys are good about that. And then after that, we get mitosis, the actual splitting. And here, um, I'm going to use, and I can't remember which student made this sample for me last year, um, but these are both really lovely, and I thought they were good. What we're just going to look at is kind of step by step what happens in the cell. And one of the reasons we're going to look at this is tomorrow when we get the microscopes, I've got some prepared slides back there that have samples of cells that are undergoing mitosis. And so you can actually look through and find cells at all the different steps along the way. Does that make sense? So let's, let's talk about it. And the first thing is, you probably know a little bit about um, this, uh, but your DNA um, isn't one big, long um, chain of DNA because we have so much of it. In fact, it's divided into a bunch of different chains. Do you know how many chains of DNA you have? And what we call those? Inside of your cells, the DNA is kept in a nucleus. And it's not one big chain of DNA. You actually have, it's not 92. Half that. No, not quite. Yeah, half that. 40, half 92. 46. You actually have 46 chromosomes. In fact, you have, you have uh, 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad for a total of 46. I don't know if I should say mom and dad. That's more of a parenting thing. But you have one from your biological father, and one from, or 23 from your biological father, and 23 from your biological mother. So the first thing that's going to happen is what we call prophase. Now, may I start by saying, instead of calling it prophase, um, it seems like prephase would have been the first one, right? Because it's the first thing that happens. Like a football game, the pregame show. But that's not the name. The name is prophase. Um, the truth is pro can also mean like in advance of. Um, but anyway, prophase. In prophase, um, we're going to do this just by drawing pictures. And we'll make a few notes. But does that make sense? The cell normally looks like this. We have a cell. And then in animals, in plants, in all complex cells, there's a second membrane inside where the DNA is found inside. And what's that called? The nucleus. And the chromosomes are in here. I'm going to draw four of them because drawing 46 of them would take a long time. Does that make sense? But humans actually have 46. Different animals have different numbers. So let's just quickly draw. That's the nucleus. And these are the chromosomes, which is the DNA. Each little packet of DNA is called a chromosome. I don't know where the name chromosome comes from, actually. That would be, could you do me a favor? Could you search for the etymology of the word chromosome? Do you guys know what the word etymology means? Not definition. That's definition. Etymology is like the origin, where it comes from, yeah. So if you search for the etymology of word, it tells you kind of where it comes from. So in prophase, What's going to happen is this. What is it? Is it color? Yeah. Color body. I don't see what that has to do with this, but there we go. Except that when you stain the cell, the chromosomes are visibly a different color. So that's probably it. So what's going to happen is this. Guys, we need to split the cell up. The problem is if we split the cell up right now, all the DNA is in the nucleus. And if we split the cell, 
one side's going to get a nucleus and the other side is not. Does that make sense? No, you would think, right? But actually what it does is it just gets rid of the nucleus. The nucleus starts to dissolve. Well, we'll talk about that. And then what happens is the chromosomes are in there, but once the nucleus dissolves, they're going to be kind of free to move around. By the way, I'm drawing the, the chromosomes as an X because we're going to kind of zoom in on this. Remember we said at the end of interphase, they are duplicated. We make copies. Well, each chromosome is stuck to its copy. Does that make sense? So these are duplicate copies and they're held together in the middle, right? If you photocopied something and you want to hold them together, what do we use? A stapler. We put a staple in it. Well, chromosomes are actually held together with a little structure called a centromere. Oh, God, I just erased one of my copies. Some poor child is going to be born missing a chromosome. Um, so uh, this is called the centromere, and the centromere uh, holds them together. And now what the cell wants to do, the reason that it's dissolving the nucleus, is we have to take these copies apart, don't we? Because we want to move half of them to one side of the cell and the other half to the other side of the cell. Does that make sense? Now, we could just wait for them to float where they're going. How well would that work? Probably not very well. So if you were doing this, you would probably want to pull them apart, right? So the cell is going to pull them apart. How is it going to do that? Well, the answer is uh, it's going to tow them. It's going to make a little tow line, yeah. They have little tendrils. They have little tendrils, that's right. And so what happens is these structures appear at the two poles. The cell builds them, and these are called centrioles. And if it seems like it's a lot like the other name, there's a reason for that, which is the centriole is going to grab onto the centromere. Does that make sense? That's why they have a similar name, because they're going to pull on each other. And they're going to start to produce basically ropes. They're called microtubules, which literally just means they're little tubes. Um, we give them the name spindle fibers, um, which comes from like spider webs. A spider has a spindle. It makes fibers like make spider web. And because when you look at it under a microscope, it starts to look kind of spider webby coming out of these centrioles. And that's what's going to happen during prophase. And for now, we're not going to write any words about this. We're just going to draw it. Does that make sense? We're going to draw it and talk about it. And then we'll write words maybe later if we have to. But I think sometimes just thinking about this visually is plenty. Yeah. Um, in my old school, we yep. had a bunch of microscope things. Yep. And they were all of the steps of microscopes. Yeah. I I yeah. So I have some slides too, and I actually want to get some more. Um, I've been meaning to order them. But some slides where there's just... Uh, something was sliced off as it was alive and reproducing, and the goal was to actually go through and find one of each. Can you find one that's in prophase? Can you, yeah. Is that what you kind of did? Uh, no, what they did is they had things that were already set up. Oh, I like that. There was like one that was already in prophase. <sighs> I should see if I can buy that. That'd be great. Yeah. It was like a little pamphlet. It was oh, that... a pamphlet, and that it would, it would like describe the step, and then it would be the collapse, and then the next side would describe the step. Well, that's collapse. really cool. I like that. Just um, yep. Sorry, off topic. No, no, off topic. Just leave her Looks like it. Yeah, here, I'm going to run out of time. It's no off topic. Um, so I'm bad enough to begin with. So that's what happens first. And if you think about it, it makes sense, which is we can't pull these apart if they're stuck inside of a nucleus. And we can't pull them apart if we don't start building things to pull them apart. Yes, I did. Um, remember I asked you all questions? So now, in the second stage, no worries. Oh, that's right. In the second stage, and thank you for reminding me, because I do appreciate it. So we have prophase, and the next one is called metaphase. Meta phase. Oh, is that all you need it for? How'd it go? I'll get you those pictures, by the way. If you just put it there, I'll email them to you. Can you please not? I lent you my camera. Go take a picture of Calford. Take a picture of me. I don't care. Go take a picture. I hate having my photo taken, Toby. And normally I say yes, but honestly, you're using my camera. I don't have to have my photo taken with my own camera. That feels like extra torture. Then it'll end up on my Google Home when I upload all my photos, and I'll be like, great. And I'm looking at my, the picture of myself in a flannel shirt. Love it. Okay, so that's prophase. In prophase, the nucleus dissolves because it has to. Because if you don't break the nucleus, how are you going to move the chromosomes? 
and then we start building the fibers that move them. Now in the next stage, what's going to happen is those fibers are going to keep growing. And here's the deal. Every fiber is going to attach to every chromosome, and it turns into a little tug of war. And assuming both sides are equally strong, if you pull on things with a tug of war, where does that thing end up if the two people are the same strength? In the, in the middle. And sure enough, that's what we see, is that by the time they're in metaphase, there's this period where the chromosomes all end up basically in the middle of the cell because they're being pulled in both directions. And they're being pulled by the spindle fibers, which are connected to the centrioles, and are connected to their centromeres, just like that. And the truth is, there's lots of spindle fibers kind of going anywhere, because it's not like they knew where they were going. They grow out looking for the chromosomes, All right? So, the exactly. Yeah. So they don't just go to the chromosomes, because they don't have, like, magic, you know, something to know exactly where chromosomes are. So it looks like a big mess like this. And then the ones that connect start pulling, and because they get pulled in both directions, there's this stage where they line up in the middle. All right? And we're going to do a little zoom in here. And we're going to see that what is happening is we have the chromosome. And we have the center of the chromosome, which remember we call a centromere. And the centromere has the spindle fibers attached to it going to both what do we call this structure again? Centriole. And again, at first it sounds like a lot of the same term, right? Like, oh my God, those sound really similar. Oh, spindle term. That doesn't make sense. Spindle fiber. But actually, the naming does kind of make sense in that the centriole grabs onto the centromere. All right? And how it grabs onto it is by making these tubes, by making these fibers. And again, spindle gives you a sense of what it looks like under a microscope. It looks like spider webs. It looks like a lot of really thin fibers. Yeah. My aunt, she works at a hospital. Like, she works at some big hospital somewhere in Ottawa. And what they do is, is when somebody passes away and they, like, donate part of their body to No, you her, told me. Don't you dare. Yeah. Um, she said that they had to cut pieces of the muscle and stuff, and they had to go, and they donate it to a bunch of high schools and colleges. Yeah, I've, I am on... said that they donated about 300 body, like 300 bodies. Worth yeah, I, uh, I have signed up to have my body donated to science. So who knows? You know, when I die of a heart attack five years from now, if one of you's in med school, you could end up cutting up Joe. Just being oh, like, oh. I have to go to med school now. You could be like, oh my God, look at this guy. He should have taken care of himself. Um, they're going to put me in the pile of like, you know, uh, dealing with out of shape people. But anyway, now, imagine... The world's most, this, I shouldn't have even said this. But okay, here we are, I'm committed. I mean, I'm not committed, but I'm going to make myself committed. Imagine the most horrible possible tug of war. Let's say uh, Asher comes and grabs my right arm, and Ethan comes and grabs my left arm, and they're tugging of warring, and they are both just refusing to give up. Uh, what eventually happens to poor Mr. O? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, you're just going to take me right in half. All right? By the way, don't do that. I, I like my body currently, and it's in its stuck-together form. But if you think about it, if these things start shortening and shortening and pulling and pulling, yeah, these end up at the middle, but neither one's given up, and they're both stuck on there. Eventually, what something's got to give, and what gives is the centromere. What gives is the kind of staple holding the two things together. And the two copies of the DNA that the cell has made are going to separate. And once that happens, if you can imagine... If they had ropes tied to my arms and they were pull, pull, pulling, at the moment at which my body did perfectly break in half, um, like just right down the rib cage, um, because they were pulling really hard, it would move really quick. Does that make sense? And indeed, these do. Very quickly, they start to move to each end of the cell. And so in anaphase, we see them now just single pieces like that, no longer stuck to a copy of themselves four going this way, four going that way, and they move quickly. They move towards that centriole. And what I want to take away from this is I think so often this gets taught like something that has to be like memorized, but I think other than the names, which we're just going to try to use until they feel comfortable, if you think about it, there's not really much here to memorize. It all makes sense, right? Just think what has to happen. If I was trying to take this cell and cut it in two, well, 
there's really only two possibilities. And Kira immediately jumped to the other one that makes sense. It happens to not be right, but that's the only other possibility that makes sense is, well, the nucleus could split in half, go to both sides, and then the cell could split in half. And by the way, that actually seems like a simpler system, but it's just not what happens. The other possibility is the nucleus can go away, the chromosomes can go to both sides, and then the cell can split in half. And that's what you're seeing here is going to happen, right? And then all the stuff, well, if the, what's, why, why are they going to move to both sides? DNA doesn't have legs, it doesn't have flippers, it can't swim across the cell, so they can't move itself, right? DNA is just a big code of information. It's just basically a big long chain of paper, so something's gonna have to move it. What's gonna move it? I don't know, let's make some tubes. So they make some tubes, they make some fibers. Basically a spider web. You can kind of imagine each centriole as being Spider-Man, just slinging that web and pulling, right? So still we have the centriole, and here now we have the chromosome, but it's no longer duplicated. Right? Now, no, a chromatid, good, good job remembering that one. But chromatid is actually, we're going to talk about after. Basically, these are all coiled up for safety. Chromatid is when they uncoil so the cell can actually use them. Okay. In interphase, the chromosomes are what we call chromatid, which is they uncoil and it's just a big spaghetti like <laughs> mess of DNA that the cell can actually get onto and read. And then when it's time to reproduce, the cell takes that and coils it up super tightly into the chromosomes so that they're easier to move and so that they're safe. That, you're just a day ahead of me, but that's very good. Well, uh, there's a few answers. It's, uh, the first thing is we actually discovered the basic phases just by looking. You're going to see tomorrow under the microscope that you can see this stuff. Um, but then we discovered what's actually going on by an incredible amount of lab work. And again, you cannot see DNA molecules. They're too small. So what you have to do you want to know one of the things they did? Do you know how we figure out the shape of DNA? This is crazy. It is so small, you cannot possibly look at it. But what you can do is you can let it form a crystal. And then if it forms a crystal, you can shoot x-rays through it. And when you shoot, you know this, if you shoot light through glass, it bends, right? And if we make bent-shaped glass, it can take light and change shape. We're going to learn all about this in our optics unit. Well, DNA crystals are basically a piece of crystal. And if you shine light through it, it will make the light bend. And x-rays see light way too big. Like if the light rays are too big, DNA is not going to do anything with it. But x-rays are really small rays. That's what makes them so dangerous. They're really, really small and powerful. They can get to small places like your body. And if you shoot x-rays through a piece of DNA, you can see how it bends the light. You can measure how it bends the x-rays, and then work your way back and figure out what the shape of the crystal might be. That is gypsy voodoo magic. And I took one class where we did that when I was in university. And let me tell you right now, it is smart people doing this work because the math is crazy, but the lab work is crazy. You're shooting x-rays at things, you're using photographic film, <laughs> and then you're building models, and then it's crazy work. But that's how they do it. So now the last stage is what are we going to want to put? You're going to tell me what the last stage looks like. Once we have these where we need them, do we need the spindle fibers anymore? No. No, so we're going to get rid of them. Do we need the centrioles anymore? No, so the cell's going to eat them up, get rid of them, use the materials to build other stuff, right? No, just like I uh, built a new shed this summer, so I took apart my old shed, and I used all the wood from my old shed uh, to frame some walls inside my new shed rather than waste it. Does that make sense? And I sold the roof to it to some guy who wanted a roof for his shed. Great. Done. Um, so the cell's just going to recycle all those parts. The DNA. If we're going to unspool it, let it go back into chromatid, and let it do its thing, we know that we want to keep it safe. So what are we going to build around our DNA again? Now the nucleus. Only this time, how many are we going to have? Two. And then, what are we going to start doing with the cell itself? Well, just like in binary fission, we're going to start pinching it in. Does that make sense? Um, so this is the final phase. This is called telophase. I've heard some people call it telophase. That's fine, too. Telophase, telophase, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, orange, orange. Comfortable, comfortable. Joseph, Giuseppe, Dessert, Desert. Um, Manat, or... There you go. I'm, I'm working on it. I feel pathetic every time. Um, well, see, most of us call Manat, Manat, because we're, you know, because we're Americanized, but it's properly pronounced. But when I try to say it, Manat, I feel like I'm just doing a very bad job, right? Yeah, so, but I'm working on it. So we start getting a new nucleus, and it's going to form and form and form, and we get a nucleus in both sides of the cell, and we have one, two, three, four chromosomes in there, 
and they aren't X-shaped anymore. Why aren't I drawing these X-shaped anymore? Yeah, they're no longer stapled to a perfect copy of themselves, right? Because a cell doesn't need two copies of its DNA, just one. The reason we had two copies at the beginning is because the cell was ready to reproduce. And so uh, the cell at the end of interphase, at the end of its regular life, um, starts to actually, and I am going to show this as just developing because we're doing the arrow here anyway. Um, so why wouldn't I do that? I should have done that. That would have been the smart thing to do. So we get the nucleus forming, and by the time telophase is done, what happens is we have that kind of pinching in of the cell like that, and we have a nucleus on each side, and in the nucleus we have the chromosomes, which once the cell goes about its regular life will unwind. I'm actually going to draw that in the next slide. Um, this usually gets a chuckle. I'll say in advance. Um, this pinching in, uh, what do we call it when we cut something in two? Uh, if you want to cut a big piece of meat, you're going to need to use a meat cleaver. So the word cleavage um, means to cut something in two. Of course, it also has a different use in sort of pop popular lexicography that unfortunately also looks a little bit like this. But this is called the cleavage furrow. Sorry? Lexicography? Uh, just uh, the words people use. Uh, vocabulary would be another one that's very common. Uh, does anyone know the word vernacular? Vernacular is like language that everyday people use. The irony is, you want to know a word everyday people never use? Vernacular. Vernacular, which means the words that everyday people use. This happens a lot in language, right? That is a word that doesn't describe itself. But that's okay. So this is called the cleavage furrow as the cell pinches in to cut in two. And um, obviously, we get the forming of new nuclei. What is nuclei? Very good. Right? So one is called a nucleus. And in Latin, the us ending, is that Latin or Greek? I don't know. Anyway, whichever language that comes from, the us ending gets pluralized as I. So we get new nuclei forming, and the cleavage furrow pinches the cell in. That's the end of mitosis, which this is a weird distinction. And I don't really care, except to say that mitosis is actually the steps by which the cell gets ready to cut into, and then the actual cutting into is given a different name. I don't know why. It's always seemed stupid to me, but it's just how they do it. So at this point, we say mitosis is over, and then the last stage is called... No, that's a different one. We'll get to that. Then um, we get something called cytokinesis. And cytokinesis... Cytokinesis comes from, does anyone rem remind me, what does that cyto mean again? Cyto means cell, good. And kinetics, anyone taken physics? Obviously not, because you guys are in grade 10 science. Manat, Manat, have you taken physics? Damn it. Kinetic, does anyone know when we talk about something being kinetic? Kinesiology. I'm a kinesthetic learner, people tell me. It means physical. movement. Yeah, physical movement. So this literally just means Cell movement, which is kind of a stupid name for it, but it literally just means when the two cells move away from each other. They actually split and they actually move apart, and now they're two separate cells. Does that make sense? So the final stage is cytokinesis, where at the end of mitosis, we said these things were almost pinched apart. We have a nucleus in each one um, with the chromosomes in each one, and what's going to happen now is that it's going to actually split into two cells, which will move away from each other and go off and do their own cell thing. And the DNA is going to uncoil. And we're still going to have four loops of DNA, but now you'll never be able to see the loops of DNA because they're just dissolved in the cell. They're just tiny. I just did a DNA extraction with my grade 11s yesterday in biology, uh, a mostly unsuccessful one. We're going to try again today, but where we extracted DNA from a banana. Very and awesome. you can see... Uh, I've done the strawberry one, too. They're both good. I like the banana one. Um, uh, but I like the strawberry one, too. The banana this year, anyway. But it's actually cool. When you do it, you can see the little tendrils, little wisps, and that's actually like billions of DNA molecules all together. So that's the final step, is that the cell splits in two. And now, again, what do we call the two offspring cells? Daughter cells. And then the chromosomes chromosomes, that's right, uncoil, 
into loose DNA called chromatid. Um, and the reason it's loose, uh, this DNA can actually be read. You can imagine that if you have all the DNA and you've coiled it, coiled it, and tightly packed it, and tightly packed it, and tightly packed it, that's great for storage, that's great for moving around. That's right. But once you actually want to use it, once you actually want to read it, you have to take it and uncoil it. Does that make sense? So this DNA can actually be used by the cell. Um, so when the cell is undergoing reproduction, um, its DNA is actually shut down. It's like, hey, we got to shut down the library while we, uh, while we you know, build the new building. And those are the steps of mitosis. Um, you're going to get a project tomorrow that you'll have about a week to work on. Um, and it'll actually be, I don't often give things that I want you to work on outside of class, but it's going to be to make some kind of medium that represents this. And here's a couple of physical ones. I think this one's really good. I really like it. I really I like, like it. I like this one a lot. I think they did a nice job. I like the use of clay. Um, like I said, somebody made me cookies. I'm smart. Do I have clever? Yeah. Took a picture and I ate them real good. I ate them all. I was like, I'm going to have one. I was in my car and I had the second one. I had them all. I was like, I'm eating pro phase right now. They look at heat, right? They just go bad. It would be sinful to waste. I grew up in an Italian yeah, family. You don't make food on your plate. That's right. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a virus. Like, I don't know. Hey, um, <laughs> where's but, uh, my thing for winning yesterday? Oh, shoot. Honestly, I will get you tomorrow. I, I, I owe you. I, well, I do, what, really, like, give me a snack. Let's get a chocolate bar. Thanks. Twix? Sold. I'm going to get you the king size ones. I need to oh, let's okay. go. Um, Student so, also owes you. Do they really? Get yeah, on they it. Also, yeah, and they told me to wait, and then I never got my stuff. Student council, yeah, get that's on what it. They told me um, to oh, you, I'm sure they'll page you down at some point today. Um, so listen, I want you to get thinking, because you can build a physical model for sure, that'd be great, but can I tell you some creative things I've had people do in the past? And again, I'll give you the actual assignment tomorrow, but if you want to get the wheels spinning, um, I had somebody build a mobile once. Um, true story, my plan at the time, I had a little baby, so I thought that was cool. They made me a mitosis mobile. And my plan was to go put it up over Charlie's crib, which I thought would be really neat, and really was, because I had it already, it was sitting in my shop, um, in a box, and then my shop is my garage, and my garage, if it gets heavy, heavy rain, um, because it's below ground level, water comes flooding in, and water came flooding in and like ruined a bunch of stuff, including this mobile. But wasn't that a cool idea? The one that like hung over a baby's head and had all the things in order. I had somebody make a claymation animation of it once. That was super cool. I had somebody 3D animate it once. That was cool. Somebody once built all of it in Minecraft and then shared that world seed with me. That was awesome. Um, I had somebody record a podcast episode once. It was all audio. So they had to figure out a way to like describe this in a way that made sense. And it was really good. And they did it like they had music and like they even put ads in it, which was funny. And like, but it was like they made a podcast out of this thing. Um, I've had people um, just make a YouTube video where they just explain it. And like they just use diagrams off the internet, but they are. The diagrams aren't the thing. The thing is them talking through and explaining. That's cool. And if you're interested in any of those things and you want help with any of those things, you're going to have, like I said, a whole week to work on it. And so if you're like, oh, hey, I'd love to film something, that's cool. I've got a bunch of cameras. I've got all the equipment you need to film stuff. Awesome. You want to record some audio? I literally have two recording studios set up in two different places in the school. I would be delighted to help you do that. Um, if you're like, hey, I want to work with clay, but I don't have clay at home, just let me know. Say, like, hey, Orlando, I need you to buy me some clay. I'll go buy you some clay. Um, if you're like, hey, I need Bristol board and markers, I'll get you Bristol board and markers. Um, if you're like, hey, I need coat hangers, toothpicks, uh, seven rubber bands, uh, two packs of chewing gum, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a pack of breath mints, I'll be like, sure, okay, you bet. Um, within reason, you tell me what you need, I'll get for you. If you're like, hey, Orlando, I need a, a 40 a liquor and a drive in your car, I'll be like, I don't know, I don't really know what that has I to do with mitosis. That. But within reason, you tell me what you need, and I'll, I'll set you up. So you don't have to have that answer today, but I want you to think about what you want to make me. Um, there's nothing wrong with keeping it simple. Like, I think these are both lovely. The main thing is kind of presenting the information in a way that makes sense. Um, and I think this makes sense. This has a couple minor issues. Uh, this has a couple minor issues. This is actually fine, too. Um, but can anyone spot what the issue is with this? What did they get wrong? Did they lose their mark? There's one thing that's supposed to happen that doesn't happen here, which makes this whole thing kind of impossible. Well, actually, it doesn't make it impossible. It makes it kind of what Kira suggested should happen, which Kira suggested that the nucleus should just oh. split in half, right? Not have 
And here, they just have the nucleus kind of, they have the spindle fibers inside the nucleus, right? And then the nucleus splits at the same time the cell does, which isn't actually what happens. So that's the only issue here. Um, yeah, see the yellow nucleus? Where should it disappear? Here, and it shouldn't come back until here, right? These sections should not have the yellow nucleus. That's okay. We have a little error. Errors happen. But does that make sense? Yeah. Sure, you bet. Um, if time permits, by the way, uh, we take we take a step back to chemistry every year when Christmas time comes. And uh, I usually the last day of class we go down and flip one of the kitchens and we'll put these chemistry cookies. Um, so yeah, we'll get to use some baking, but yeah, you bet I will. So think about that. But the main thing I want you to say is this too. Listen, I want to explain something to you. When you study biology. Um, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. You do have to review things, all right? You do, because biology is information rich. And if you want to keep this stuff straight, can I tell you how I studied for biology courses always? I would always get a little spiral bound notebook, but you could use any notebook. You could use a duotang, but don't use your binder. Right? Don't use your binder, um, because you don't want it in your notes. And I always just put it here, and all I ever did was anything that was kind of like this, anything that was kind of a process, or like diagrammy or things like that. All I did was just every day, I'd just draw this out from memory. And the first day you might do it and you might be like, ah, there's a cell and then there's two cells and oh God, I can't remember what happens here. That's fine, spend, don't spend forever, spend five minutes, do the best you can, and then get your notes out and fill in whatever you couldn't do. Does that make sense? That's it, it will take you six Excuse minutes, you know, if that. So you can do it at the end of English class. class. The next day, do the exact same thing. Day after that, just do the exact same thing. By the end, it'll take you 30 seconds. You'll just go boom, 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 label everything, know what it is. Does that make sense? Honestly, I promise you. And there'll be two or three other things this unit that are kind of like this. All together, they will take you seven minutes a day, six minutes a day, and when test day comes, you'll be like, I don't even need to think about this. It's just in my blood, I know it. The crazy thing is, 30 years later, you'll know it. This is how you study for things. But again, you'll, you'll accomplish nothing if you have your notebook open and you look and copy it. That's not useful. What you have to do is your best job possible to remember it, even if that really sucks. But spend five minutes and say in five minutes, you can look at the clock, I'm going to get all the information I possibly can on the page. Then open your notebook and add what you missed. Then don't think about it again today. Next day, same thing, five minutes. Next day, you won't need five minutes. You'll do it in three, and you'll maybe be missing one thing. And you'll be like, oh, shoot, now I remember that. By day four, you'll do it in two minutes, and you won't be missing anything. And then the rest of the unit, it will honestly take you 35 seconds to draw, and you'll just, you won't even have to think about it. It'll just be in there. You guys ever talk to you about how to study, how to learn, how to get stuff in that brain of yours? No. It's useful. It's useful. So honestly, and if you want a little spiral-bound notebook or you want a little duotang, just let me know. I'm happy to get you one, all right? Um, but you can go to the, the best ones, dollar store, right? A buck twenty-five. I think at the dollar store is a dollar anymore, is it? So like a buck fifty usually. For some things, yeah. Um, I remember like when the dollar store, a lot of things would be like four for a dollar. Nothing like that now. Anyway, that's because I'm old. On the other hand, I was making six bucks an hour, so you know it's not like that was a great deal. <laughs> Yeah. Come look. We'll, we'll plug them in. Guys, I ran out of time, so I have nothing else for you today. So listen, but and obviously there's only two minutes left. Chill out when the bell goes. You're good to go. Don't go early. And oh, perfect. I'm all yours.